Thanks, John. Can everyone hear me? Hopefully you can. Um, warm welcome to everyone on the session on targeting the coronavirus polymerase. I just want to remind um, all of the attendees that the floor is open to questions throughout the talks. So please post your questions and they will be addressed following the talks. So targeting viral polymerases is a really well-validated approach to direct acting antiviral therapy. For example, there's clinically used compounds uh, to treat HCV. And along with the viral protease inhibitors, these compounds are and will continue to be staples in the single and combo treatments um, of viral diseases. So in today's session, we're going to hear about remdesivir, which Gilead was uh, quickly able to develop for COVID and which became the standard of care for treatment of this disease. And we'll hear about molnupiravir, which Merck is now developing for the treatment of COVID. Both of these programs emerged um, with compounds that existed prior to the COVID pandemic. Thankfully, they were available to be able to be uh, tested uh, for this disease. And we're also going to hear about approaches to discovering new polymerase inhibitors, which could be developed uh, to treat coronaviruses in the future. Um, so I'd, I'd like to now introduce uh, John Bolillo, who is Director of Biology at Gilead. And he's gonna speak with us about uh, remdesivir in the response to the SARS-CoV pandemic. John is currently leading the Respiratory and Emerging Viruses Group at Gilead Sciences, where he's uh, focusing on coronaviral anti-drug discovery in addition to other respiratory viruses um, in the clinic. Prior to Gilead, Dr. Bolello served as a principal scientist within the infectious disease department at Merck. And there he led discovery teams to evaluate HCV preclinical compounds, such as the one I just described. Um, Dr. Bolello uh, began his industry career at Identix Pharmaceutical, uh, leading HCV uh, antiviral drug discovery there as well. And he was um, a postdoc fellow at the Harvard Medical School with Ron DeRochers and Penn State University. He studied basic biology and recombinant generation of multiple viruses, including rhesus herpes viruses, SIV, baclovirus, and others. John received his BS in biochemistry at the University of Delaware and his PhD in molecular biology from Penn State and attended two, class, two years of classes with a pharmaceutical chemistry program at the University of Florida. So with that, I will uh, hand it over to John. Well, thank you, Jen. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Today, uh, I'll be telling you about uh, an experience in collaboration uh, that basically prepared us for the COVID-19 response for remdesivir. Uh, the coronavirus polymerases, I'll do a little introduction here. Uh, the coronavirus polymerases replicate their genome and proofread using the polymerase. Uh, they also have transcription and RNA capping to produce the mRNA transcripts. This is done by a replication transcription complex composed of about nine proteins, of uh, which a very simple model is shown here with the NSP12 polymerase, RDRP, the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, at its center shown here, although that might not be accurate in the physical location. Uh, this complex is there to uh, replicate the genome and create transcripts for protein translation of new viruses. To inhibit this polymerase, uh, one of the key strategies right now is nucleosides. They are the only established class of replication transcriptase inhibitors. Uh, currently, there are uh, several, but I'll highlight five here. Uh, first, that being remdesivir, which is the approved drug for SARS-CoV-2 in hospitalized patients. Uh, which is approved in the U.S. and also has uh, use authorization in Europe and other 50 other countries. Um, there's molnupiravir, which is currently being investigated, and my good friend and uh, former colleague Jay will tell you more about that. It is uh, under investigation as an oral drug instead of an IV drug as remdesivir is, uh, and it is currently in phase two, three trials. There are there is favipiravir originally utilized for uh, influenza that is in phase three in Japan. Uh, it's a high dose, uh, but in the hamster model, it has some efficacy um, at very high doses. There's the ATIA compound, which is in phase two, which Ashley Shannon will tell you more about its other potential mechanisms other than a direct acting polymerase inhibitor. And then galadesivir, which potency is pretty low, 
Um, but there's still some investigation going on to its potential as a SARS-CoV-2 inhibitor. So the nucleosides all require some metabolic activation. At their core, whether they're a nucleoside such as galadesivir or a, a minor prodrug as molnupiravir, which has a simple metabolic uh, progress to its active triphosphate, um, or favipiravir, which in, requires the uh, nucleobase addition uh, to become a mutagen, uh, there's remdesivir. Remdesivir exists as a phosphoramidate prodrug and it requires a cleavage of this phosphoramidate by cellular, cellular um, metabolizing enzymes to a monophosphate and then to a diene triphosphate with its active species. I'll tell you more about its uh, mechanism of action uh, as a delayed chain terminator and also a terminator once uh, incorporated into the template strand. But not to skip over the other drugs, uh, molnupiravir and favipiravir are RNA mutagens and uh, we'll learn more about 527 as a potential NIRAN inhibitor. So the nucleosides and nucleotides, they have some distinct advantages over other uh, classes of drugs in that they're likely broad spectrum antivirals against a large number of viruses. Against coronaviruses, uh, there's potential pan cov activity because although the polymerase has variable uh, conservation, itself, the active site where the triphosphate of these nucleosides binds is 100% conserved across almost all the coronaviruses and definitely all those that are infectious to humans. So a nucleotide with potency against one, SAR, one coronavirus is likely going to have pan-coronavirus. And history has shown us that the nucleosides have a high barrier of resistance compared to non-nucleosides, protease inhibitors, and others. Now that hasn't been borne out in coronavirus, but uh, if history is on our side, uh, we are, if history is anything to tell us, we're going to likely see a higher barrier to resistance that is harder for the virus to overcome. Now they're not all positive and good. Uh, they often have uh, some difficulties in metabolic activation. Uh, you'll see some of this in the history of remdesivir in coronavirus is where uh, whenever you read a paper and there's Vero cell uh, potency of remdesivir. Uh, it is generally a low potency because Vero cells have a difficulty in uh, creating the triphosphate from remdesivir. Uh, other nucleosides might also have a similar fate. Um, there's also potential for off-target effects and in the delivery of these nucleosides is often quite challenging. Um, and there are several papers that you can look at uh, historically to get more details on this. So the breadth of the nucleotides can be exemplified here, not just against coronaviruses, but across the board on most viruses. In general, the mutagenic uh, RNA mutagen nucleotides and nucleobases uh, have almost uh, pan-viral activity. Uh, remdesivir has very broad activity. There are some places, other some viral families it does not inhibit. But um, among the ones we're talking today, coronaviruses and other respiratory viruses, it's quite broad in its spectrum of activity. So as mentioned, the uh, history of remdesivir actually precedes SARS-CoV-2 by almost a decade. The uh, derivation and discovery identification of its nucleoside, 4 for 1, 5, 2, 4, occurred in 2009. And throughout 2009 to 2013, it was investigated for its broad spectrum antiviral activity, including that of SARS-CoV and other coronaviruses. In 2013, uh, Dustin Siegel and others in the medical uh, med chem department here at Galead added the phosphoraminate prodrug to monophosphate prodrug to the nucleoside to enhance the level of triphosphate formation in cells of interest that are infected by many viruses. Uh, understanding that the triphosphate was the active species, it was our effort to try to boost that level of that active species in the right cells. And what happened thereafter for many years was a concerted effort with a number of academic institutions and governmental institutions uh, shown here at the bottom who worked with us and really led the, tri led the uh, actual benchtop experiments in many cases 
in the absence of a BSL-3 at Gilead and also with their expertise. Uh, and that included looking at MERS and SARS uh, with um, Tim Sheehan and Ralph Barrick, uh, with Mark Dennison and others, uh, Emmy DeWitt, and the list goes on. And establishing through multiple in vitro and in vivo systems that remdesivir and its parent nucleoside likely have, act, have potent activity against coronaviruses. So at the beginning, at the end of 2019, beginning of 2020, when SARS-CoV-2 uh, emerged, remdesivir was key and pretty much primed for uh, evaluation against SARS-CoV-2. And that is what happened, uh, why we were prepared and why this occurred so quickly. So uh, although, although identified publicly at the end of December, in January 10th, the Chinese CDC um, identified this coronavirus. And from there on out, uh, very quickly, within about two or three weeks, Gilead responded with uh, starting trials and, and um, treating patients with remdesivir. As you see, the myriad of various trials uh, at the bottom of this figure, uh, not to go through them in detail, uh, happened rather quickly to where on May 1st, remdesivir was granted emergency use authorization in the US and then a similar authorization in the European Union uh, in the beginning of July. With the success of the Act 1, Act 2 and uh, simple trials, uh, remdesivir was given FDA approval at the end of October uh, and is now licensed uh, for treatment in um, about 50 countries. Uh, it's also been investigated, I'll tell you in a minute, um, with uh, other, with being investigated with other drugs of interest. So getting to what my core is, which is the um, in vitro and in vivo, uh, you know, efficacy of remdesivir, I just wanna go through how remdesivir actually works. Um, the first mechanism of action that we understood about remdesivir is that when it's in, put into cells, it's metabolized by these uh, cellular enzymes to the monophosphate, which a fraction of it, a smaller fraction, does get converted to the nucle parent nucleoside, but the majority of it is converted by uh, cellular kinases to the active triphosphate. Now, this active triphosphate competes with the cellular ATP, the native ATP, for its uh, ability to be incorporated into a nascent RNA strand uh, as, it's, uh, as the polymerase is progressing along the template. Uh, when the uh, polymerase uh, comes across a uridine, it provides the complementary either ATP or remdesivir triphosphate. Uh, and then I'll tell you a bit more, goes a couple more, ba three more bases and then terminates transcription. Now it's important to note here on this slide is that remdesivir actually is preferred by the SARS-CoV-2 polymerase at nearly four to one over the native uh, ATP. That isn't the case with all viruses, but it certainly is the case with the coronaviruses. Um, however, it is not favored amongst cellular RNA polymerases, including that of the mitochondrial polymerases. So getting into the details, much more on the uh, mechanism of action, while working with Matthias Goethe and group, um, we observed that uh, the incorporation of remdesivir causes an inhibition three bases, after three bases are added. So once the nucle hot nucleotide is added, the inhibitor remdesivir is added, the triphosphate, and then the polymerase extends three more bases and then it stops. And this gel here is an example of that where the cellular ATP uh, without any remdesivir completes the 14 mer. Whereas remdesivir, when it's added, it ad here it adds one, two, and three bases and then stops. And this occurs because when remdesivir comes in as a substrate, remdesivir triphosphate, that is, comes in as a substrate, the next base, the second, and the third base are added. But when remdesivir, the one prime cyano of remdesivir gets to the fourth position after, it has a conflict with serine 861. And this causes the abrogation of future progression. Now that was the first mechanism we understood from remdesivir. So years ago, about 2017, through work with Vanderbilt University, Mark Dennison and Andrea Prusers, um, they observed that selection of, of resistant viruses in the related mouse hepatitis coronavirus revealed a V553L mutation that was able to have some low factor about five-fold resistance to remdesivir. 
And that got uh, our modelers and Matthias Goat thinking, what else could be going on here? And what was discovered, the conclusion of that is that remdesivir triphosphate could also be incorporated into the growing at, with physiological NTP concentrations. Remdesivir triphosphate could be incorporated into the template and then the polymerase could still extend to the completion of the nascent chain. So in this sense, you could have viral RNAs, including that of the genome, that, are, that contain remdesivir triphosphate. And upon a synthesis of that next daughter strand, so if you have a negative strand genome, upon with, if you have a negative strand genome with remdesivir incorporated, upon the synthesis uh, using that as a template of the positive strand, you could have remdesivir incorporated when the polymerase comes in contact with it, it's unable to put in the uh, complementary U. Um, and that is because there is a clash between that one prime cyano and the actual next base, the next amino acid in alanine 558. Now I mentioned 553 in the mouse hepatitis virus in SARS-CoV-2, the corresponding nucleus uh, amino acid is uh, valine 557. So when that valine 557 is a leucine, um, there's a change in the structure so that the next nucleotide can be added and the, um, the, the nascent strand synthesis can continue. So in this way, a small level of, a low level of resistance can be developed with remdesivir as an incorporated base. So the activity of remdesivir is dependent on its metabolic activation and processing to the triphosphate. And that occurs differentially in different cells. And we observe different uh, potencies against SARS-CoV-2 in different cells, depending on how well they metabolize remdesivir. And that's exemplified here in this slide, where um, if you look at viral cells, remdesivir has a, a weaker activity than it does in either CALU3s, HUH7s, or A549 uh, pneumocyte-derived cells. Uh, and then if we look in HAE cultures, which are human airway epithelial primary cells, uh, it's not shown here, but the activity is, um, is low, is the potency is quite high, and the EC50 is quite low. Um, and what we see is the level of the potency of remdesivir is consistent with the level of triphosphate form. So in viral cells, remdesivir produces very low levels of triphosphate compared to its parent nucleoside, which produces a little bit letter, a little bit more. Uh, and we see that the potency of remdesivir is lower in viro E6 than its parent nucleoside. In other cell lines, and including that most dramatically seen in the HAE cultures, we see very high levels of triphosphate, which are synonymous to its uh, high potency. Just to show you uh, that a little bit more graphically, uh, in these HAE cultures, remdesivir produces more trifo active triphosphate over a 48-hour period than the parent nucleoside. And I'll show you in a minute that uh, in the next slide here, that leads to better potency of remdesivir. This work uh, done in those HAE cultures uh, by Johann Nietz and Dirk Jockman's lab, we can see that um, at equivalent doses of uh, let's say 0.4 micromolar of the parent nucleoside, the uh, level of RNA is higher with the parent nucleoside at a similar dose than it is at remdesivir at that dose. So the increase in the triphosphate formation in the HAE cultures is directly related to uh, increase in potency. In animal models, uh, the uh, efficacy of remdesivir was shown in a CES1 knockout mouse uh, because uh, mice have uh, circulating esterases in their blood and plasma, which break down the phosphoramide too quickly uh, in the bloodstream rather than in the tissues of interest. So Tim Sheehan and Ralph Barrick and their lab looked in a SARS-CoV-2 model, a chimeric virus that it was the early days before we had uh, mouse adapted viruses looking at remdesivir, treated with IV, BID for five days in these mice. Uh, treatment was initiated 24 hours after infection, so a true treatment model. And what we can see by PenH score, which is a measure of pulmonary function, uh, the higher score means that the mice are, are having um, resistance in their lungs due to an airway infection. 
we can see that remdesivir lowers that resistance in the lungs and the pulmonary function is improved compared to vehicle. That's consistent with the viral load titers being lower. So remdesivir truly does in an efficacious model, in a mouse, in a treatment model, um, have a efficacy. Now in collaboration with Emmy DeWitt at Rocky Mountain at Labs, we evaluated this in the rhesus model of SARS-CoV-2, which is infected by every which route you can think of, IT, intranasal, intraocular, and orally, and treatment with remdesivir was initiated 12 hours after the infection. What we see is an improvement. Uh, in black here, you have the vehicle, and in red uh, at the bottom, you have remdesivir treatment 12 hours after. We see an improvement in the clinical score, which is consistent with uh, less congestion observed in the x-rays of the chest, and also which consistent with lower viral loads in the lung. In the ACT-1 trials in humans, placebo-controlled, it's a phase three trial in adults, uh, comparing a single dose of 200 mg loading dose of remdesivir given once daily for 10 days. Um, and the um, compared, it was a placebo-controlled trial in which we see uh, that remdesivir did have a clinical benefit in regards to the time, re time of recovery, overall mortality um, compared to the placebo showing that there was an advantage uh, to remdesivir in uh, hospitalized patients. In uh, a further trial, uh, the simple trial, there was a comparison of whether a 10-day versus a 5-day treatment with remdesivir um, had, was, had any difference. And in this trial, we saw that the 5-day and 10-day both led to clinical improvement, uh, recovery, and a lower mortality there than the previous placebo-controlled study. Uh, and this also showed that the five-day course of treatment was as effective as the 10-day in patients receiving low oxygen. Now, uh, you know, the WHO solidarity study had different results than those trials. And this was a different study design uh, than was run for in the ACT-1 and SIMPLE studies. Uh, it, there wasn't really a consistent standard of care introduced to uh, evaluating these four treatments. Uh, it was done in 40 countries. The interpretation of a, per, a patient's status upon receiving treatment uh, might have been different between different countries. So, uh, you know, without having too many exceptions here, they did observe that there wasn't an overall mortality benefit when they looked at the 99% uh, confidence interval. However, there was a trend in the not when looking at the 95% confidence interval. It should be said that these patients were, um, you know, at varying uh, disease states and often were at the very severe state of disease uh, in which uh, remdesivir did not show uh, as good activity as when people were, were at the low flow oxygen stage. So most recently, there's a lot of concern about the SARS-CoV-2 variants of concern, and uh, which are uh, different than the uh, A lineage of the Washington or Wuhan strain. And so uh, to ensure that remdesivir didn't have any different uh, potency or efficacy against these other lineages, either the UK lineage, South Africa, or the Brazilian, um, now denoted alpha, beta, and gamma in that order, um, we tested in vitro uh, in a plaque assay uh, whether remdesivir had different potencies among these, and it did not. Uh, now, these other three lineages do have one single amino acid in the NSP12, which is the P323L, which is consistent in all of them. And we, uh, uh, we observed that there was no effect uh, of that mutation uh, or any other uh, you know, genetic mutation in uh, these viruses that affected remdesivir. And I should add, as I said earlier, uh, in viral cells, you get much poorer potency, and we observed that here. However, we observed in other cell lines that there was a, an unequivocal, uh, non-equivalent infection rate of these different strains in other cell lines. So we really wanted to use um, the, uh, you know, a, a cell line that really captured the equal infection. So that's why you see the difference here. But the overall message here is that the potency of remdesivir was not altered. So um, 
So what, uh, what I've shown you today is that remdesivir is a selective inhibitor of the viral polymerases, very broad spectrum. Its potency is related to its triphosphate level. Its mechanism of action is chain termination, either by delayed or as an incorporated uh, nucleotide in the template. Um, the efficacy was shown with remdesivir was shown in SARS-CoV-2 animals, and uh, the decreased time to recovery was observed in patients with moderate uh, and severe COVID. So what we're doing currently is addressing how we can treat uh, patients in outpatient settings, uh, either through an inhaled remdesivir, which is in phase two, uh, the oral analogs of remdesivir are underway here at Gilead. We are taking remdesivir and evaluating it further in children, pregnant women, and people with uh, renal stage. And there are a number of combination therapies uh, that remdesivir is under trial. I really like to thank our collaborators throughout the world who have led us to where we're at with remdesivir, starting uh, with the nucleoside in 2009. And uh, with the interest of time, I will uh, please uh, thank my collaborators here and my uh, colleagues here at Gilead and take a question. Thanks so much, Don. That was really fantastic. Uh, we have a question from Stephen Sterley asking, um, so the replication transcription complex is recruited to the double membrane vesicles, possibly derived from autophagy. Does that impact the accessibility of these inhibitors or possibly represent an alternative therapeutic strategy? Not that we've observed to date. Um, we've looked at different combinations uh, it is, we do have some understanding that uh, hydroxychloroquine has some interference with the progression of remdesivir to its triphosphate. Uh, it was uh, since then noted not to be given in combination. Thank you. Um, and another question, uh, combinations between remdesivir and immune modulators have of course been tested. And uh, the, this, person is asking, what about the combination efforts with other direct acting antivirals like the protease inhibitors? Uh, I think when we have expanded access to those, for sure, we would look into that combination, uh, as I'm sure those developing the protease inhibitors would, uh, would want to do as well. Um, so I, I would say that's uh, forthcoming. Okay, and a question from Jay Bradner. Uh, terrific presentation, uh, vitally important work. Have you studied um, REM preclinically, for example, uh, in animal models with other antiviral agents such as protease inhibitors and inhibitors of entry, so similar? Uh, we have not done an efficacy study with a combination at this time. Okay. Thank you very much. I'll just keep it simple. Yeah, it's, uh, it's something we'd like to do, but we also have to balance the IV of remdesivir uh, with uh, you know other drugs as well. Great. So thank you very much, John, for presenting. And I think we're going to move on to um, Ashley Shannon now.